Brandon McInnes, and I am the technical evangelist for Ubiquitous Entertainment here in Tokyo, Japan. I am part of the Akihabara Research Center, which is also part of Ubiquitous Entertainment. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about EnchantJS, which is our open source JavaScript HTML5 game development framework that you can use to create games easily and quickly. So this framework um, was created in April of 2011 and has several features to make creating games much easier. As I said before, it is open source and it's distributed under the MIT GPL3 license. It has class-based programming. It is truly cross-platform because of the way HTML5 works. And it has a core library that is extended by many plugins to bring in different functionalities. So, for instance, it, there's a plugin for WebGL, there's a plugin for physics, there's things like that. So, let's talk for a moment about why it's open source. We believe that open source is one of the best ways to get your software debugged and fine-tuned for use by a core population. You can use it once, or learn it once, and as it is upgraded and goes through different iterations, um, because you've already learned it, it's much easier to keep using it even as it gets upgraded. Um, HTML, with HTML5, you can't really hide your source code, so we thought, hey, we don't really have a choice, so might as well make it open source. And finally, probably the most important reason is because with open source software, it's probably the best way to polish the library because you're crowdsourcing and you're getting the opinions of many, many different programmers. So let's talk about HTML5 for a second. Why, why do we want to use HTML5 for this game development framework? Well, you have all these different platforms that HTML5 works on, all, all these different browsers and devices. And by doing so, you open up the world to, you open up your game to a much wider audience by doing so. Some features of HTML5 are that, like I said before, it is cross-platform. But one caveat here that you'll see in these parentheses where we have written the lie is each browser interprets HTML5 just a little bit differently from the next browser. And that can create some problems when you're creating games. It can be a little tiresome to create a game and it works fine in Safari, but then when you open up in Chrome, then it doesn't look right, some little thing is off. So, um, with our engine, with EnchantJS, it sort of takes all of those problems and uh, standardizes them um, as far as your development is concerned. So when you open it up in multiple browsers, it will look the same. With HTML5, uh, like I said before, each browser sort of competes to improve performance, and um, since you can get the whole source code of your game, you can, you can pull it off there. It's not that hard to, um, for anyone to see it. So, let's talk about HTML5 continuing on and expound upon that a little bit as an operating system. So traditionally, we have legacy operating systems that are based on hardware. You have hardware BIOS, then the operating system on top of that, and applications, applications run inside of that operating system. But we believe going forward that HTML5 is changing this landscape. So we have hardware BIOS OS, and on top of that, a web browser, an application. And then inside of that web browser, you have applications that are written in HTML5. You can see this with several mainstream web applications uh, in use today. So when you pair that with JavaScript, uh, JavaScript comes with it's a functional language scheme and it is a sort of special and strange prototype based object oriented programming language. And what I mean by that is there are no true classes like with Java or C you have classes, actual classes that you import. But with JavaScript there's no true classes. You can create prototypes that are sort of pseudo classes. We'll, we'll get back to that in a second. Um, but the most important aspect of JavaScript is that you can manipulate the DOM, the document object model, uh, on web pages inside of browsers. And it's super powerful in that aspect, but it's not always so easy to use, especially when you're doing high-level things like game programming, which is why you need EnchantJS, because EnchantJS simplifies this process exponentially. So let's jump into the code a little bit and take a look at EnchantJS, the library itself. So the first thing you need to do is download it from EnchantJS.com. Go to EnchantJS.com, you'll see a download link. You can download a zip file and extract the zip file. And inside of that, you're going to see a folder called Examples. You open up the Examples folder, you're going to see a file called index.html. If you open that up and look at the source code, you're going to see a couple script tags that call in different JavaScript files. Most important being the EnchantJS library and this other one called main.js. 
Typically, people write their games in a file called main.js. You can write it in whatever you want, but normally you will see most games written in main.js. Um, so you can use any text editor to edit your games. I recommend, personally recommend, one that has syntax highlighting like Sublime Text 2 or something like that. Uh, if you would like an online IDE, integrated development environment, we have created one called code.9lead.net. If you go there, you can register for free, we won't spam you or anything, and you can start writing your games in the browser. One thing that makes code.9lead.net particularly useful is while you're coding your game, you can hit run at any time, and instead of opening up your browser or loading up the file that you're working with in Sublime Text 2 or any other text editor, um, you can just click run in the browser and immediately see the results of your code. So it's kind of useful. So I'm going to talk about the four foundation classes of EnchantJS real fast. So at the top level you have a game object. Everything lives in the game object. So you have sprites that are inside of the game object and you have labels. So if you want to represent text in any capacity you need a label. Um, and then there's a scene. Now, the game object is the master object here, and inside of that is a scene. You can have several scene objects, but usually you're only working with one at a time. And then inside the scene, you have sprites and labels. So really, it's sort of like this nested uh, system here. So that's all. It's pretty easy. Game object, scene object, and inside of the scene, you have sprites and labels. So let's look at the code a little bit. Here you can see we're calling the enchant library, and then we're saying once the window loads, we're going to create a new game object. And in this section here, right after you create the new game object, you're going to prepare your game asset. So any global variables, we'll, we'll get into that in a second. And then for the actual game itself, you put it inside of this property called game.onload, which is a function, it's a method. And um, then you initialize your game object. And then once you've written your game code, underneath that function, you write game.start, and that executes the game and says go. So if we populate these little sections where we have indicated we can write code, we have game.fps, so frames per second. How many frames per second are we going to have? And that's going to be 30. We're going to designate that as 30. And then inside here, we've got some stuff here, which I'll go over. So our basics. Like I said, inside the game object there are scenes. There's always a default scene called root scene. So game.root scene, right? And then the sprite can go inside of that. The label can go inside of that. Um, but to get these items, sprite and label, to appear in root scene, we add them to the root scene, but we need to do something else to make them visible. Because we have, while we have our scene structure, there's also a visual object tree, something called the visual object tree, and we have to activate it. We have to say, become visible, so everyone can see it. So there's this other method that we use called add child, and um, add child adds it to the root scene and makes it visible to the player. So here we can see we have game.rootscene.addChild. Hello. Let's talk about variables for a second. So each we have multiple classes, obviously, in Enchant.js, and each class has its own properties, its own variables. So here, we're creating a label, which I'll get into the syntax of later, but just take a look here at hello.x and hello.y. What, what could that be? That is position um, as measured from the top left corner of the screen. So the top left corner of the smartphone screen here is going to be 0.0x 0 .0 and y coordinates. So when we say, say hello.x equals 10, we're saying when you create the label, create it here, like 10 pixels over from the top left corner, and hello.y equals 10, you come down 10 pixels. And then finally we say root scene.addchild hello, and then it becomes visible right there. So that's how that works. Um, here we have created a label called hello, and like I said before, it is of the label class. So it is the hello object of the label class. Um, be careful, because classes and objects are different. Classes are sort of like the prototype, the blueprint, and objects are instances of that class, or things that are created in the image of the class. So we could say that if we had a class called man, if all of humanity was represented by one class called man, then an object um, of that class, or instance of that class, could be Bill Gates. Now when you create an object, 
using class, you have to create it using something called a constructor. So here is a constructor. We're saying hello equals new label. So create an instance of the label class, but we're also passing this argument here. Hello there. What is that? Well, with the label class, specifically the label class, when you pass an argument as a string, it has to be a string, that will indicate the text that is represented by this label. So as you can see, hello equals new label, hello bear, will ultimately create a label with the text hello, comma, bear. So, like I said, this is the name of the object, this is the name of the class, and um, we use new to invoke something called a constructor, and the constructor creates an instance of the class. So, like I said, this just sort of represents that, and we initialize it as hello bear. That's that argument there that I told you about with the text. So each class has its own properties. So here the label class has three properties, three main properties, x, y, and text. And um, this is how it would be represented in the code. We could say hello.x equals 10 for the x-coordinate, hello.y equals 200 for a y-coordinate if you wanted to bring it down a little bit, and hello.text equals hello bear. So these properties can be changed at any time, and that's the important thing with objects and instances of classes. You can change their properties at any time, and by changing it, you create interactivity. So here, um, if we create, here we're creating the label with hello bear, so originally it has the text hello bear, but later on we're saying hello.txt equals hello cow poly. So what is that doing? Well, what that's doing is when the object is created, when this label is created, it has the text as hello bear, but later on we change it to hello cow poly, and when we specify hello.txt equals cow poly, the text property of the label also changes to hello cow poly, and that propagates down because the text um, property is what is shown here. So once we change that, it'll say, hello, Cal Poly. And um, we, we access these properties by using a dot, so hello dot text, right? The other thing I want to talk about is event listeners. Now, event listeners are incredibly important in games, as well as just web pages in general. When you have a page that loads, um, or you have a game, several events are occurring. Um, on, on the computer when a user is interfacing with the computer. So not only when the page loads is that an event, like we could say on ready, uh, when the page is ready something happens, but also when the user clicks or when the user clicks and drags something or lets go of a click, all of those are individual events that we can target. We could also, another event is the propagation of time. We specified our frames per second to be 30 before, but um, so basically what that means is every second there are 30 frames being created. When a frame is created, that is also an event, and we can target that. So um, here, this event listener, we have touch end. Now touch end specifically indicates when a user lets up off of a click. So if a user's on a smartphone and he's touching the screen when he lets go of that touch, then a touch end event will happen. So here we're saying create an event listener that listens for a touch end event, and then when the user lets go of the label, the user clicks and lets go of the label, then the text will change to hello cow poly. So what this does, um, basically, is we create the label with hello bear, and it shows up as hello bear, but if a user touches it and lets go, or clicks it and lets go of the click, then the text will change to hello cow poly. So that's, that's sort of a primer to event listeners. So, like I said, these are all different events, like if something is touched, <laughs> he dragged me, or time elapsed, these are all events. Um, and they're all represented through these event listeners, or rather access, they're access to these event listeners that listen for these events and trigger some code, basically a function, when that event occurs. So, with the add event listener, um, function, there are two arguments. The first one is the name of the event, touch end, and the second one is the actual function that gets executed or ran when that event occurs. So, the, like I said, there are a variety of events, but the most 
important and most widely used, or most often used events, are the first and third ones, touch and an enter frame. These are the essential ones for when user clicks and enter frame as time goes on, as these frames are being created um, in the game. So we can change it like this, enter frame, it, enter frame, let's, let's look at like a time propagation event listener. If we have enter frame, this means when every single frame is created, then do this. We have this dot x plus equals one, and because this is on the hello object, um, it is referring to the hello object. So this is basically equivalent to hello dot x plus equals one, which means that we add one to the x value of the um, label. So what is this going to do? What is this going to do? If every single frame that we have being created moves the label by one in the x direction, plus one, what's that going to do? Well, it's going to move to the right. It's going to move to the right. Just like that. So if it's here and we start the game, it's just going to move over. Just like that. So that, that's what enter frame does. And um, congratulations, you are an EnchantJS freshman, and now you know something about classes and sprites and labels and how EnchantJS works on a basic level. Thanks!